Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, it's Lucid, and I'm joined once again by Maryland. Howdy, guys. So it's uh, it's turn sixty two, and before we get into the meat and potatoes of this turn, Maryland, I want to take a detour uh, and talk about some yeah. of the the casting, just kind of what it's been like to cast this so far, and some of the the ethics and etiquette around it. You cool with that? Yeah, I. I think it's a excellent topic and a bit of a side branch from what we what we normally normally do. Um, it might be neat to do it while we are looking at the map. Well, we're going to have a lot of spoilers on the map. Um, oh, right, I can pull up. Right, I'll okay. pull up an old turn so that uh, we'll pull oh, up sixty one sure. here, so we have something to look at. Yeah, just something to look at while we're talking. So it's always nice. That there's a visual. Yeah. So I, you know, I think one thing, you know, there's a, a few things I think I just want to say to start this conversation off, which is, you know, first of all, Maryland and I got eliminated from this tournament um, in the, that is the previous correct. round. So we are offering, I think we've both been playing the game long enough and we have enough experience. We can offer meaningful commentary on what these players are doing, but these are all players that have made it farther than we did. Um, so maybe they're better. You're right. I'm not sure, but, right. but, it, but yeah, it doesn't mean they are better, but there's a pretty good chance they are, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, well, we, I, we got eliminated. I can tell you, some of these guys have better grasps of detailed mechanics than I do. Yeah. Very much so. Um, some of them have strategic views that are different than mine, at least, or, and in some cases, there's some players in this game that look at the game even farther ahead than i tend to look at right you know i tend to be looking a long time in ahead you know you talk about in chess uh, top players are looking 50 moves ahead or whatever some of the players in this game are looking right towards the very end of the game turn 100 possibly yeah and uh i tend to just be a little more intuitive with that sort of thing so i mean there's there's some skill differences some skill variation yeah, and, you know, it's totally possible that, you know, you and I are good at different parts of the game and that the other players are good at different parts of the game and they may be weak in other parts of the game. And you could be the best at having a mechanical understanding of, like, how all the things work, but be a little not great at the tactical stuff, you know, about how you actually put that all together into a cohesive strategy to win a certain battle um and then at the same time be great at the like high level strategy like the diplomacy and the game architecture stuff or any mix of that so right um and i guess my point is that there's very nobody has the definitive truth on what is right what is wrong uh you know what is good play what is bad play and you and i certainly don't <laughs> uh I would also comment that I'm not the kind of person that reads every patch note to try to be sure I understand all the changes. And yeah. some of the people playing this game do. Yeah. And and they could actually interpret those somewhat vague explanations or they'll go and dig into it. Um so to give them to give fair credit there. But I think one of the things you were you were talking about bringing leading into this discussion was that our opinions are that there are opinions it's how we probably would play a nation and sometimes we may come across a little overcritical yeah but uh i would <clears throat> the caveat there is that we have been challenged in the past on the youtube comments and or on your discord when some of our viewpoints have been challenged that hey you know i don't think you're right here i think this guy was doing something else or the one where i had a mechanic wrong on the soul vortex and and i got a little defensive against that and then i pulled back and i went okay fair enough um yeah oh probably to clear that up because we talked about that a few episodes ago soul yeah. vortex does not cause fatigue damage we've, we've yeah. driven that to ground but yeah you you yeah. thought it did but there's no way while we're doing a recording to go check very quickly so you know we just ended exactly. up talking through it so and um and I have this thing in my mind that still says, but I remember seeing it happen, which could be all the way back from Dominion's three or something, or it could be just 
it looked like it because something else was going on. Sure. Yeah. Who knows? But it's still in my head because I haven't taken the time to test that. But my point was just, you know, uh, I'm open that if somebody wants to say, hey, you guys are, you know, I disagree with your viewpoints on the grand strategy of Ohm, for example. Yeah. Well, and I'm open to that. Yeah. And I think, too, it's more fun for us to record where we're actually talking about our opinions. Like we could go through this and just be like, well, this battle happened here and this happened and this happened and this happened. But to like get into the drama of what's happening, I think we have to have opinions. Like if we don't have opinions, well, we're not really we going to have the drama, you know? We wouldn't be giggling and laughing so much if yeah. that's all we were doing. And so, we do get. And, that, and, and that has built up over time that, you know, we've gotten more excited when we go to record. Right. And of uh, course, when you're excited, your, your mouth might get a little ahead of your brain. Yeah. So, you know, to, 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 to kind of play out the drama and to talk about what's happening and to have opinions, you know, we have to be able to say that we think people are making mistakes or we would do things differently. It doesn't mean that it's right. Um, and the other side of the thing is for the people that are in this game, sometimes it can feel, you know, like they're getting picked apart because we're nitpicking what they're doing. And especially if that's coming at a time where they're like losing a war, it's hard enough to lose a war in Dominions. Like it's a stressful thing. It um, is. Yeah. And then it's even more stressful to have to lose a war and then to have everything you did get picked apart and second guessed on YouTube. So, you know, I, I think we need to try to be mindful of it and try to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, that these players don't have the complete information or they may have other things they're trying to do. You know, like End is out here. We had a discussion in the YouTube comments about End. And they're riding out here doing pretty heavy raiding with medium armies rather than fighting a lot of these big pan doom stacks. Um, and that's a that's a choice. It's a choice. It wasn't a choice I agreed with. Be, but yeah, it might not be your choice, and I'm but, not sure it's my choice. Well, but I didn't make it. Story. I didn't make it to the tournament finals either. So, <laughs> well, in my tournament 13, I did a somewhat similar kind of thing to try to save myself from death and it didn't succeed but I, I did actually kind of bust out all over the place trying to counter raid and throw the guy i was trying to gain that initiative back because i was losing it yeah it, it didn't really work but yeah so um i think one good thing about what it's one of the things i've come to realize about doing this tournament though maryland is um in some ways this is like a game. You know, it's kind of like with chess, you know, chess masters will refer to, oh, there was this game or that game. And they're like, all the moves right. of that game are recorded. And it's like a shared experience for everybody. They were like, oh, he was in this position. He did this and this was the result. In some ways, that's kind of what the tournament is. It's a, it's a very public, like chess game where people know most all the moves that happened. And so it forms like a common thing that everybody can talk about. And so well, you can and, say, well, in this situation, okay. I did this, or this is where this nation's really strong, and this is where this nation's weak to this. And you can kind of see how things play out with really skilled players in real life. To jump to the etiquette part of that is that we told everybody, I'm, I, if I remember correctly, that this would be happening, that we would do a, a recording and a continuous commentary of this game. So anybody in the final... You yeah. know, you kind of knew what you were going to get. You couldn't be sure what that was going to be exactly. Yeah. But I don't think anybody who's either watched my videos or yours thinks that we're milk toasts and don't have opinions. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's true. Uh, so there, there's that little piece of etiquette. Another thing I was thinking of is for any mm -hmm. hockey fans, and I have mentioned this in some of the recordings before, you and I have a dynamic that reminds me a bit of Don Cherry and Ron McLean on – hockey night in canada which as a canadian everybody grew up with that and uh you know sometimes don cherry would just chew the crap out of a player for what probably wasn't a bad decision at all but yeah part of that is making tv making it interesting yeah if you don't have opinions then why watch a talking head yeah <clears throat>
So, Alrighty. yeah, I, I think just, you know, the thing is, is it's, oh, I think, and you know, the viewers, you and I've put in a hundred hours making this at least and so oh, far yeah. and the viewers will have, if people have been watching all the episodes all the way through, they'll have watched close to like 60 hours. Um, so I think it's totally, it, it's kind of this common experience thing. Everybody's going to have their own opinion and there's no right answer. And so I think that's one of the actual cool things about the tournament is it's like a, a common experience that everybody has. It's like a common set of data that everybody has different sets of experiences with. Well, so. it sure has generated a lot of talk. Yeah. Like you can see the talk about the tournament on every one of the discords. Yeah. And we do know from them telling us that ill winter watches this. Yeah. So, yeah. So shout out to you guys for making a great game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that we all go kind of nuts about and are more serious about than, than makes normal sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, which, um, I, I kind of want to start with the Ulm Vanheim conflict. Are you cool with that? Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, how about you want to read Ulm and I'll read Vanheim? Sounds good. So Kirby, I guess, is doing it right now. Uh, so who are the two that we're alternating a bit on Ulm? Kirby and um, who is his helper? I could look it up here. Let me just confirm. It's always nice to get the numbers right here or the names right. Oh, Toolbox, Toolbox. and Kirby. Yeah, it came to right. me. And, and Toolbox was the guy who beat me in 13. So, right. you know, yep. credit to Toolbox. He he got good. Yep. Update on the Van Ulm War. There's been so much hindsight 2020 this game, it makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> of course, all of the misplays that I made regarding the lost royalty, but I will say this. When Van attacked us, Ulm could have had flames from the sky tech and the king of fire if I had planned better. Kicking myself big time for that one, but we are where we are. Yeah, and we've commented on that. Um, well, we haven't talked about flames from the sky really, but that is one not, of the things that not, the not way specific. Vanheim was doom stacking that would have been very punishing to him. But I did mention that I am much more a proponent of using elemental royalty as battle magi than than SCs. Right. I'm not a big fan of them as SCs yes. at all. Yeah. I'm not either. I think they cost too much. They yeah. need too much gear, and they still have, they all have terrible weaknesses. <clears throat> yeah, it'd be like buying a Rolls Royce and driving it through, like, I don't know, downtown Baghdad or something during the middle of a war. Right. Yeah. I could see that Van outplayed me, so we have negotiated with Van for peace, although it is closer to a surrender, thankfully not unconditional. The only leverage that Alm had in the end was that we could put iron walls in every fort and make him take three turns just to crack each one. But we wanted out so we could pursue other, hopefully less painful, avenues of expansion rather than contraction, if you will. I think this is an excellent decision on his part. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reserve my judgment for a minute. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we could get there. In all five forts, we'll be lost to Van as the result of the war one of which is the hard fought over Bandar, although he may not realize until later that he still has to patrol on a dream horror. Oh, hmm. <laughs> and a myriad other. So somebody put up a horror seed. What a painfully awkward spell. We, Wait, dream horror is up. different than horror seed. I don't actually horror know what a dream horror is, but I know it's different. I thought dream horrors were created by horror seed and there's the separate spell that creates dream horrors. I thought there was two involved um, there. Horror, horror Seed is speed. here. Send and Dream then, Horror. This is different. Reported as a random event. A defiler of that, dreams. Okay. No, that's correct. So it's not bugged. Yeah. Or not not as weird. And it's because we had a discussion on just how does Horror Seed work. I don't remember. Was yeah, I wonder here? who put the Dream Horror in. Bandar log if it wasn't Vanheim. Like who would have done that? Well Pangea maybe? Yeah, Pangea might have. Astral Astral Blood, not too many have that capability. I'm just thinking who was fighting Ulm that would have Astral and Blood? I mean maybe Pangea. He could have blood empowered a Um Astral Vanheim's Ash, but, God. Yeah. Vanheim's God. Yeah, could have been Vanheim. 
uh, and a myriad of other unfordered provinces, but we negotiated back a handful of miscellaneous territories. So in all, I think that Van was very accommodating. We we're back to an NAP3 with Van. It's a hard hit to take, but Alm is pretty resilient in terms of income. Yeah. And also, we still have lots of statistics. So this brings up yeah. that if he kind of knew this was underway, no wonder he didn't back off Satis. I or think this, I don't know if, I mean, we have no idea of knowing really how long this negotiation has been underway. Um, I, my guess is it was only recently, but. Yeah. But that was only one turn ago. It was just last turn that he sieged yeah. Satis's capital. Yeah, that's so true. So he might have been in the process of this. Yeah. Well, and he would have written this to us last turn. Yeah. So anyways, uh, let's let's ahead. see what Vanheim has to say. Uh, last turn, I forgot to mention that I killed Alm's Iron Angel with my very first mind hunt. Ha! You and I were talking about that. Can you mind hunt it? Yes. Is it likely? No, because it's like 21 MR. This yeah. turn, I also killed both his math Master Smiths at uh, 161 with mind hunt. You and I were also saying he's not really a mind hunt nation. Well, look at him go burr. Yeah. Wow. Uh, apparently, Alm realized he would eventually lose the war to me, so he offered peace. He was ready to give up a fair bit of territory. We eventually agreed that I would get most of the provinces I had already taken, as well as Bandar's cap, and the fort provinces of 146 and 90. I'm quite happy with this peace. It makes me a lot stronger economically, and it would have taken a long time to defeat Alm fully, with all those forts and him starting to cast iron walls everywhere. Now that I have decided who my next target... Now I have to decide who will be my next target. Most likely, I will throw the fish back into the water before he gets too strong. Um, and that would also give me the throne of water. Plus three defense on my bless would be very nice. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Good. So this actually... Let's try to digest this from the own position. From the own position, he gets potentially... Okay, let's take a look at how much stuff he's got. Ooh. Wait, where's Bandar I'm guessing Lug? he's going to lose three forts. And... This is Bandar Log. Okay, so he's going to lose three forts and about 10 or 12 provinces. That's kind of roughly what I'm guessing. Yeah, I think he's going to lose a bit more after what's already happened. Maybe come down to like here. Well, I'm but look at his forts. he's going to gain Satis stuff, presumably. Well, if he can get there quick enough... No one's going to contest Satis. I don't think anyone's in a petition yeah. good position to contest it. And they don't know. Hopefully they don't know. I mean, if Fan played a dirty trick and told Pelagia, oh, you better grab some Satis quick. Oh, he doesn't want to. He's thinking about fighting Pelagia. Exactly. <laughs> so, so I think Ulm is in a great position to take all of Satis, which is what? One, two... Three more forts, yeah, and about ten provinces. Was in a good position. Oops. Turn one anti magic. That thing's back. Is it? Nope. Uh oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. No turn one anti magic. Can we look at the god? Yeah. Um. So it's back. He's got this oh. dude. I don't even know where that guy came from. Uh, that would be. That would be a transformation. Yeah, but if what? I mean, was, this doesn't get these paths. Oh, a gnome. It's a gnome. A gnome. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. We. Well, that thing's taken a bit of a beating over time. I mean, it's back, but it's cursed. It's not horror oh, mark. Yeah, watch the watch what happens to this army though. Oh no, it's a wipeout. This army's all dead. Oh, oh it's one oh, thing to say God. it, it's another thing to see it though. Oh wow, oh. just a melt. Just a melt. Oh my god. That hurt. That hurt. I And the Neater is back inside the fort. Yeah. Yeah. Oy. Well, well, that was uh, 
good play on Statista's part. He got that he got that god back pretty fast. So he's got quite a few priests tucked yeah. away that we don't see. Well, he does have those. Uh, if he bought them, he's got the holy threes, so you can call God pretty quick. I just have this image of Alm where he's like, it's this, I don't know, like a 25, not the player, but just the nation. It's just like 25 year old dude. He's had a hard go of it. And every, every time he sees somebody new, they just come up and they kick him in the nuts really hard. And he just grits his teeth and he uh, bears it. It's like Vanheim comes up and kicks him in the nuts really hard. Uh, and he bears it. <laughs> And then now Satis <laughs> kicks him and then it's really hard and he just grits his teeth even harder. Ugh, I'm gonna be okay. <laughs> well, so in um in my game against Toolbox, he played really quite strategically differently. He paired a very quiet, slowly growing, stay out of war, kind of build up this unbelievable economy. And once he reached that point, he just ate everybody. Yeah. Ohm has not really played that kind of a game. He's mm -hmm. sort of I dabbled at killing off one person at a time and and each time he goes to kill somebody he kind of doesn't mm. totally commit i think at this Great. point Ulm is mostly being played by kirby now so that would probably most uh, make sense you know it's a different play Just style a different, yeah a little bit of different strategic style from what i saw previously from toolbox um but as well you know you could argue just some things went badly for him yeah uh and maybe the alternating between the two players, the, tr the transfer might not have been quite as smooth in that, oh, I made these elemental royalty and this was my plan for them and I hope you'll keep going with my plan. And the other guy was like, oh, maybe I'll use them a little differently. And it, it maybe there's a little of that going on. Yeah. We don't really know. So this yeah. is Winds of Death, right? This is Winds of Death. The other thing that's important to note here is there's a bunch of things that make this really effective. It's in magic scales of at least magic two. Exactly. So he's getting exactly. the magic penalty. And this is targeting one of the weak points of Ulmus troops, which is they have lower MR or lower MR than normal troops. Um, doesn't doesn't one of the Ohms have that national magic boosting spell or am I no, they do. Some. They have the tempering of the will, which is a battlefield wide no. MR negates MR buff. So, yes, but it's holy. Uh, you know, I can't actually remember. I think it's like Earth I, three up. or something. Is what I think it is. Um, but what you can—I don't think it takes a gem. Oh, but I it's could be Earth. Wrong. It's yeah. Earth. It, does yeah, it it's take Earth. a gem? I think it's no gem. No. Yeah. No, it's no gems. It's low fatigue, and you can spam it like crazy. So you can either do Earth Power and then do it, or you take one of these guys who has base Earth 3, or you can just, I mean, you make Earth Boots really cheap. They're like six gems. So you can put it on these guys, stack pin gear, which is what you would want to wow. do. Um, and give them an extra gem. Well, yeah, or you could give them a gem. But if you stack pin gear, you know, which you can make really cheap, mm -hmm. um, you just you cast it turn one. And but, versus these guys with like horrible MR, it's going to hit 70 something percent of them. Um, if I you can't do anti magic, I don't remember us seeing Satis pull this out before. No, Satis so, had talked about pulling it out before. Um, but yeah, so all yeah. maybe just this wasn't, he didn't anticipate it. Yeah. He had the capability to deal with it or at least mitigate it, not deal with it, but mitigate yeah, it. Yeah, it's turn 60 though. I, I mean, I think. He's had Evocation 6 for forever. For him to jump up to Evocation 7 sometime in the past 20 turns, I don't think should be shocking to anyone. And when you get late in the game, one thing you want to... This is my, my opinion. In important armies, by the time we're at turn 60-something, by the time you're this late in the game, all important armies, you want to have turn 1 anti-magic. Um, well, it, it matters lie. a lot. I, I would comment that I have been caught by this sort of somebody bringing out a spell that I didn't anticipate. Um, because sometimes I don't put the time in to go, well, what could he be casting now that he hasn't? Or what yeah. might I see I wasn't haven't seen yet? One of the ways I compensate for that is before I heavily commit large armies, I try to probe the scripts. I'm really yeah. quite aggressive at script probing, so I'll use a thug or yeah. something a little tougher than a scout and then I'll look and see 
I mean, I'll look for gems and I'll yeah. look for high path casters with boosters and I'll think, now what spells might he be pulling out? Because playing so many communion nations, it's extremely risky to walk a big communion yep. into an enemy army if you don't know what to be prepared for. Yeah. Because you, you can get round one wiped like yeah. this by earthquake or uh, rain of stones or, you know, there's all kinds of round one wipes that are incredibly dangerous when offensively moving a large bunch of vulnerable yeah. magi. So yeah, that's, that's a method true. I use to compensate for my own lack of, sometimes my imagination isn't always thinking through, well, what might he be pulling out? Yeah. And so I've got caught a little like this by something coming out of the blue I didn't expect. But yeah, I use yeah, yeah. I mean, it's super easy for me to Monday morning quarterback this. Oh, you should have to turn one any magic, you know? And this, yeah. this is the reveal, like you're saying, of Winds of Death. This is the first time they've cast it. I think it's been cast at all this game. So I don't remember seeing anything like it so far. Yeah. No, I oh, mean, no, Vanner, it's second time. Uh, Zabalba did it to Ashdod, and oh, right. Ashdod moved his army away. <laughs> and there's just yeah. like a scout there. Uh, yeah, and then Ashdod won the fight, so that was pretty funny. Yeah, um, but Ashdod but, doesn't. Ashdod's not as vulnerable to it. Yeah, to, to people watching, by the time you get to turn sixty, for your important stacks, it is generally nice um, to have turn one anti magic. And as the game goes later and later and later, turn one anti magic becomes a pretty important component. It's not like the game winning part of army composition. It's just something in general you want to have. Um, on your armies. And there's a big difference between turn one and turn two anti-magic. So. There is. Um, also keep in mind uh, that when you've been playing for a while in a game, you, I try to keep notes of all the pretenders and blesses because pretenders can pull off these paths you didn't expect. Right. For example, normally Satis wouldn't have the death and air cross path. Right. And so that pretender is an indication that, oh, which spells do those cross paths open up? And boy, I better watch for those. Yeah. Some <clears throat> of this is giving us an insight, too, into how Satis would have played the game if things had gone better for him, too. Like, all these timings he's having now with, like, Wind of Death stuff with his god, all that would have been earlier, you know? Um, if yeah, he had a successful have... first war. I mean, this was just debilitating damage he did here. I mean, this is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And he would have been doing this earlier all over the place, potentially with his god, so. And basically risk-free. Yeah. Because that amphitheater was diseased, so. Yeah. Clearly that wasn't going to amount to a hill of beans. Okay. So, cool. is there anything, I don't think there's going to be much. I'm a little, well, okay, uh, there's one last thing I have to say on the Ulm vanheim conflict, Maryland, which is I'm salty that we don't get to see any good battles about it. Like, I was wanting, <laughs> I've been yeah. waiting for the Ulm army to have the Ulm battle against the elves. But mm. we're not going to get to see it now. No, no. Um, So, I commented that I think... Uh, Ulm deciding to go try to eat Satis is a reasonable a reasonable compensation for giving up so much territory. Yeah. You said you were gonna withhold judgment. Do you are you still withholding? You're gonna wait a turn or two, see how it works out? Well, I think this is an important forking point in the game. Because if Van Heim ate all of Ulm, which I think he was in a position to do he would be in a position to run away with the game, which is kind of what he needs to do with the fish up here doing wish farming and probably Nexus and not terribly long. Um, so on one hand, that would have been a good move for him to eat Ulm and just get ridiculously huge. On the flip side, I think the idea of like, oh, it will take me a long time to crack forts. I mean... My thinking on that is a little bit like, please, like I can, if you give me a challenge, you just need me to siege through something, I will siege through it. You know, make great eagles, make corpse constructs, make wolves, make chaff. Like you can make a lot of siege chaff. Yes. Yes, you can. And he could combine all those storm demons because we looked at. Yeah. And all the corpse constructs. We looked at the unbelievable siege power of those. Um or, or the other way to put it, as I've said, and I said this in one of my other games, it's a bit of a mugs game to try to hold up walls. 
Right. Um, because when they changed in the mechanics that each power is always twice of defense, that effectively means that if you take the same quality of unit, you're going to need twice as many inside than outside. Yeah. And that's almost impossible to do because right. even dirt cheap, high strength siege defenders like ogres, yeah, you just can't summon enough. Yeah. You just can't. And then there's so many units in the well, game. And, he get, and then where do you put them, right? Because he's going to get to determine which fort he puts them on his army on top of. So. Right. And you can't move them once you've made them. Yeah. And unless like you're going to gateway stage. stuff around every turn, which... You know. Yeah. Which eats a lot of gems. Yeah. So... But, but I think back to this decision point, the way it was headed was Vanheim was going to get ridiculously big and strong by eating all of Ulm. And instead... Ulm is going to be alive now and probably slowly eat Satis. Um, and meanwhile, Vanheim is probably going to attack the fish, which yeah. for everybody else in the game, that is probably awesome because it's probably going to be a hard war. Um, Cause again, well, this it, is going to be Vanheim fighting into a research disadvantage. Yeah. And if, if Vanheim did eat Ulm, it would be pretty obvious to me that Pelagia and Pangea now have common cause. Because <clears throat> Van would just be too damn big. Yeah. But I mean, he Pan... has a long nap with Pangea. I mean, it was like a... I can't remember how long. It was a long one, though. Uh, I think it was eight turns with extra clauses. Yeah. It was a complicated, complicated thing. And there's a clock basically ticking, which is... They wouldn't fight each other. I think this is basically what was assumed until Pan finishes end, and you know Vanheim finishes Ulm. That was basically the agreement that we're both going to get enormous. You're going to eat end, and I'm going to eat Ulm. So this I don't think be... Pan would attack him. I think he would get. And by the time Pan would attack him, Pan would be friggin' huge too because he would have finished end. Yeah. But you're right. It, this is a significant fork. Although the, we've we've been seeing forks, yeah. you know, every three turns for the last fifteen turns, serious forks in the strategic, the grand strategic view. Yeah, we have the 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 Pangean Vanheim agreement. Um, we have the Ashdod being assisted by Pelagia, and then Pelagia is going to actually give up a lot of that Zabalvan territory. You know, we've seen some significant forks that, so the, the grand strategic viewpoint of who's in the lead and who's second and stuff is shifting Yeah, almost every one of our episodes lately. So do I think it's a good move from Vanheim's perspective? I don't know. I think it depends how easily he can kick the fish out. I don't think it, I have never seen anybody kick Arco out of anything easily. Um <laughs> So I don't know how that's he's going to easily kick the fish off of land. Um, but it's possible. If he does it, then I think it's a great move. Because he'll have gotten great gains from Ulm for relatively cheap. And then he'll be able to switch everything to kicking the guy who's going to scale probably the hardest, the fish with the wish farm. Go ahead and kind of give them a big kick in the pants while getting a bunch more stuff. However, if this turns into a grindy thing with the fish, which is kind of the direction I think just my intuition says it would go. If this is a grindy thing with the fish and he doesn't make much progress, well, then I think he missed the opportunity to snowball and get really big and out of control, which I think is kind of what he needs to do if he's not kicking the fish really hard in the pants. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you. And actually I think maybe what I was talking about is I think for all, for all this is a good decision for vanheim i don't know if i don't know if i have an opinion yeah but i agree with you that there's there's caveats from the vanheim um, yeah vanheim position but i think for Ohm, it was that or die sadly i think you're right i th i i think Ohm needed to have types of armies accumulated and put together like all of his armies were scattered it's all these little things and he needed to have yeah. some big armies that could fight with the right kind of mage support and yeah. he just didn't have those so he was going to lose the war um yeah he needed he needed he needed to buy himself some time yeah 
I hope he uses this time to get those kind of armies that he can then fight, but we'll see. Um, okay, so All that's right. that. Let's go to the next one, right? Uh, I'd like to talk about Ashdod. Okay. You, could. you want to read these? Yeah, well, not worth, obviously. The A2 running so fast from the Wailing Winds was a real kicker. Rasful Skies would have done its thing. This turn, dropping the god ends of Alva's cap to burn his gems, hopefully... I don't know if Valve has any magi left. <laughs> I mean, it can't be many. Yeah. Looking at that army graph, slaves for Sabbath and D-gems for Wailing Winds. Going with the standard Foul Vapors and Elemental Play to a trit what I can before returning. I don't think there's going to be anything on top of it. Also going to start mind hunting any stealth squads that pop up now. Rotating scouts and thugs on his forts to keep him guessing. Well, that's a good move. Okay. So last last turn was that fateful turn where Ashdod was worried about bodyguards and yes. I mean was worried about assassins. So put all of his guys on bodyguard, and then Wailing Winds came out, and then his bodyguards yeah. all ran before they could go berserk. <laughs> yeah, and Zavalba flipped the flipped the chart over, and instead of assassinating, came roaring out with Wailing Winds. Yeah. Oh, so there it is. So the there line was hit, and there was nothing. There was nothing. The army moved back on. Killed some Zots here. I bet you if we look at the army graph, Zabalba's got nothing. Yeah. There was one more Ashdod message. Or, no, no, we did them both. The other one was just a little addendum. Huh. That's oh, strange. He attacked here in one. I guess it's going to be interesting to see how spoils get divided here with Pelagia. Yeah. Um... So Pelagia's got, or Zabalba's got one little bitty army of, oh, he's got a few toads over by Uruk. And he's got a few bats and toads just north of his capital. Yeah. And other than that, boy. Yeah, I think the armies, I think the armies, I mean, we can look at the graph. I think it's, yeah, I mean, he probably still has a couple hundred troops. Or 150 yeah. or something. It's stabilized, but. So, okay. okay. I, there's not really anything that's happened over here, I don't think. Do we, we oh, get a, think... oh, we got a message from Zabalba. It's been a long time. Um, I, I think it's... it's pretty obvious I'm dead now. It's been coming for a long time. I could go on and list all my mistakes, which there were a lot. But I think you've already caught most of them. Biggest one was attacking Ashdod, because I could have just sat back for a while um, and worked on Blood, Vulture, Jotunheim, etc. Um, but, of course, uh, it's easy to see in hindsight... Um, back then, I just saw that he was last in research and thought it would be easy to overwhelm him with better magic before he got lanterns done and caught up. Cheers, Stone Troll. Yeah, and that's not a bad uh, bad estimation because, yes, his research was terrible. Yeah. But on the other hand, Ashdod did have certain critical research finished. Yeah. For example, uh, Mast Fire Elementals was pretty devastating in a number of fights. Or in the flaming and arrows Ashton, on the slingers was the thing. Arrows, yeah. Yeah. If you're going to spam them with chaff, awful. those slingers are pretty good. But Ashdod also made some pretty brutal mistakes. So their war was, was you know, sometimes maybe, and to go back to our little etiquette discussion, I'm starting to think nobody here has fought this game without errors, except perhaps Pelagia, simply because Pelagia has done almost nothing risky. Yeah. And if you don't do anything risky, well, then you don't risk significant errors. Or Yeah. Well, or but you, you don't, don't have much to on. gain either. And most nations oh. can't sit back and chill in the water like Pelagia did. Um, exactly. But every other nation has took risks, yeah. and those risks didn't always pay off. Sometimes right. they paid off, sometimes they didn't. Vanheim took a huge risk attempting a you know, a fight with a whole bunch of expensive thugs and magi and his pretender and got wiped out. Yeah. Pangea took risks with his great big stacks of white centers and got them wiped out. Um, I can't yeah. think of any player in this game except Pelagia who, is, who has not had things go bad simply because they decided to take a risk. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, everybody, you know, I mean, everybody's 
information's imperfect and everybody's trying to get things done. And whenever you're trying to get things done with imperfect information, you open yourself up to some big failures. So, yeah, um, well, and, and there is nobody in this game who just up and gave up. Except Eric. Well, <laughs> which sort of, they're still alive, but they sort of yeah, get up and, and give up. We talked Asterisk, about that. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And, he kind of said he didn't think he had a hope of any kind of defense. So yeah. I, I'm not sure I agreed at that point in time, but. Um, and amazingly uh, enough, he's still in the game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the only thing that I would say, like in hindsight, looking back at the Zabalba Ashtar conflict is he, he kind of poked the bear and he didn't really have a great idea of what he would do when the bear came running at him with full force. It never seemed like. There's um, two pieces of it that I think were strategic errors. Not so much poking Ashdod, but first poking him before he finished Uruk. Because Yeah, that did keep stuff tied part. up here. Yeah. He had a lot of troops parked there. And then second, poking him before he consolidated his armies. Because when he poked him, he had little armies all over the place. Yeah. Doing various jobs. And the third was when he poked at Pelagia. Remember? Oh yeah, he yeah. Went, here at the end, yeah. I, I think probably, by that by the time he had poked Pelagia, he's pretty much dead though. Could be, but, yeah. but why? Why poke Pelagia? Uh yeah, I don't know. Exit don't, stage I left, I think. Know. Hit the button. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm tired. I'm just gonna <laughs> Yeah. I'm just gonna go fight. But, you know, he did lots of cool things. And we saw some really cool reversals from him. You know, like, obviously here on the cap, there was some pretty cool yeah. reversals. But there were a couple times where he stack wiped um, Ashdod. So, and a or, lot of times it was times when Ashdod started getting a little confident and either thought he could storm a fort or thought he could split his forces in front of Zabalba. And when he would split them forces, uh, he would lose half of them. So, yep. Cool. There was uh yeah, so cheers Zabalba. Thanks for uh playing in the tournament, everybody. A little clap. Yeah. We'll we'll do uh you know, that it's not finally over, but it's I think he's right, the writing's on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. All right, let's do Pelagia next. Uh you wanna read this one for us? All right, he's carrying on from last turn. So this is more of his um Pretender design. Looks like pretender design. Dumping luck is not advisable because, apart from all the gold gems and potentially boosters item, Pelagia has two great heroes, one of which critically has high nature, which is a must to get Hecaterides going, and for gift of reason when wishes around. The other is a forge two bonus in astral water and fire, and with the hammer he can forge one gem items with several integral types to my strategy, shrouds, shambler skins, lanterns, fire is still scarce pre-wish. Magic penetration items. Yes, water and fire. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. This guy can easily add up to the wish worth of pearl water gem savings. Dumping growth. Well, it can be dumped without immediate drama. But since one, we bet on a long game anyway. And two, we won't control many thrones till very late. The losses of not having growth will add up to a massive amount of gold. Yeah, people can look it up. There's an excellent analysis of growth scales back from Dominions 4 that shows that in the long run, it's the biggest income scale in the game. Yeah. But you have to live long enough. But if you're right. looking at playing a late game play, dumping growth, going for death scales, I almost never do because yeah. it's so much gold loss. So yeah, Arco, Arco is an interesting player in that, um, for me, Growth 3 is like an auto-pick. Like, if you look at any of my games, it's probably like 90-something percent of them are Growth 3. Um, and Arco, who is a better player than me, uh, is not like that. And he will go neutral growth a lot of times, and he'll sometimes go death. Um, like, I don't think in any way, shape, or form for him, Growth 3 is an auto-pick, which is interesting. I don't pick Growth 3 Auto, and you taught me a lesson, which is I took it with Lanka, and that was a mistake because I failed to think about Blood Fecundity, right. which any Blood Nature nation can easily cast, which solves your critical issue of all your high, um, your high population provinces getting their growth going. Yeah. Um, so I tend to Growth 1, 
at least with a minor blood nation, growth three, most of the time with a large blood nation, because you know you're going to patrol, you know you're going to want to keep above 5,000 population all over the place. Um, and then other times, yeah, it's a scale I'll maneuver up and down. I don't enjoy death scales. Yeah. But that's one of those. Like, there are some decisions I make. Like, I don't enjoy misfortune more right. than one. Just because I, I just get so exasperated chasing <laughs> barbarians. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I know people do well with it, but I, I just, it turns me off. And I don't like death scales for a bit of a similar reason that often it just feels like... Um, You're, the clock's working against you. Well, there's that, and then there's just such bad events come with it. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, so, Misfortune Death has uh, some bad stuff. All right, so let's finish yeah. his message though. So is scale dumping worth it to get cold resist or poison resist plus dark vision or potentially larger while dropping the strength in the earth? Hesitantly, my choice was no, and so far it works. That being said, the most challenging part of the game is only beginning. Okay, can yeah. we look briefly at his scales again? Sure. So we've discussed this. So he dropped his order a little bit. He went a little up on production. He went heat, which is an odd choice. Is this summer? This is um, no, it's fall. It's, yeah, it's neutral. I, we can't. I don't know if we can really see. Yeah, he went heat three. So okay. So heat is an interesting choice for Water Nation. I usually go to cold, simply because yeah, cold sort of always seems to me to synergize better with water magic. And I think then, he has access to fire magic too. Is Pelagia? I think they have the elemental things on the. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, they have a lot of types of magi. Yeah, I'd have to sit here and look at. I, mean, I don't really know them all. Wait, that that's doesn't have crazy fire. Selection of magi. I think there's fire. I don't oh, know this there guy go. does, but he's aquatic. Okay, maybe right, I, I, but, I really am not at Pelagia. But. Okay, this guy's amphibious for, and has fire. So. Well, not only that, Chandler skins are cheap. Yeah. And that, on a mage, that solves the aquatic problem. Yeah. And then growth three, luck three. So, yeah, I I would be very pleased with those scales. Yeah. Those would work for me. Okay. <clears throat> so, Pelagia this turn, in terms of action, um, catches some... Oh, there's a fertility cult here, it seems like. Oh, yeah, okay. Let's see. Fertility yeah. cult. Oh, no, it's Servants of Gaia. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Moving this yeah. army over here to put this Zabalbin Fort under siege, it looks like. And yeah. he is also... You, you remember that Spectral Mage and Ghost that were poking around Pangea right. a little bit? Well, um, here they that. are. They have taken this lake. Yeah. Could we watch that fight? Because I'm curious to see his script and the paths on the Spectral Mage and the gear. Yeah. Okay, so he's using it as a support caster. Yeah. A few Horde of Skeletons. Sad. Yeah, look at all the ghosties go. One thing that ghosts take really well is any nature or earth protection buffs. Yeah. So if he lucked out and got an earth um, specter. But that's a pretty good... Can we look at that specter again? What pass did it end up with? It was Astral Death. Um, I think it was Astral... Nice. I can't remember if it was Astral 1 or Death 1. That's a lucky roll. Yeah, death too. So that's a pretty that's a good specter. Role. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good specter. You can get some craptastic specters. Yeah. That's so this is significant. He's going to have basically all of the lakes in this horizontal um, pretty soon because this one he's coming after. He's got this one now and he's got this one. So these three lakes are all going to be his, which are going to give him. This also gives you a bit of a of a window into his mind. And that in terms of land he wants to control, I expect it will also be along this horizontal. Because um, he can yeah. use these as raiding bases to to strike out from. You know, oh, exactly. He'll, oh, he also has this too, one. though. Oh, Yeah, so he'll lab every single one of them. Yeah. And then, uh, then he can gateway wherever the heck he pleases. And he's probably going to get these two lakes pretty soon. What's interesting is over here, Vanheim has already forded up his with the Kelp Fortress. Oh, nice. And this is clever because this is a way to say, nope. Yeah. You're not going to, yeah. this is off limits. You're not, not going to come in here getting, and set up a fort. You're not getting a free pond. Yeah. And that's pretty anybody clever. I like that. Voice, anybody with voice of Tiamat 
and holy searching and death searching can get a lot of gems out of pawns. Yeah. Um, you know, voice of Tiamat, the chance, and you get the, the the breakdown of what sites show up in water is a little funky. It's not what you kind of anticipate. You don't yeah. get as many water sites as you might think, and you get more fire and air than you might think. Yep. <clears throat> Okay, All so right. that's Pelagia. He's basically going on a mission to take the rest of the lakes. Um, it's going to be interesting if we get a message from him next turn or what he makes about the the development between Vanheim and Ulm, which is in some ways good for him because Vanheim running away with the game by eating Ulm is not good for him. That's definitely very bad. No, no I agree with you there. But it's going to mean he has to fight Vanheim, so it's a little bit like, eh. Um, so all we've got left really is Ind and Pangaea. Okay, well, let's get to it. So two big risks this turn. The first is caused by a mistake. I forgot to put Nature Gems on the Courier with the God Stack. That means um, if his Bernie face jumps onto my army with Vapes again, I'm a little hosed. I did put Pearls on my Gem Carrier, so I could retreat to Uruk and have my God scripted um, for Vortex of Returning. So if there is a magic phase attack, everyone goes back to the capital. Um, and if there's not, well, then we'll just step back. I'm willing to risk it for the momentum because the province that army is in isn't in In's dominion. And he saw it scripted for Serpent's Blessing. If his god jumps it at all, it'll probably be, be with, I don't know, Firestorm and Wailing Winds or something. Also, he's going to storm the fort south of Uruk so that he can gateway that army somewhere else, possibly to intercept my storming the Throne of Knowledge. Um, I think he might even do a double gateway trap uh, to block my storming of the Throne of Plus Pearl and come to his northeast. Anyways, um, a second risk is sending my fatigue stack northwest, uh, where it's in range of in consolidating his armies, putting his sacreds at the front, and ordering them all to attack. Um, denying the fatigue spells the time to build up. Since he has the tech, he could also do his own howl and stuff to mitigate the one-sidedness of the spawn spam, um, letting him outright outlast the battle. Hmm. Okay. Even outside of something silly like Ridiculous Fire Elemental uh, targeting uh, letting my wizard die, seriously, what was that? Oh, I, I don't... I don't remember that. We've missed uh, a couple think, of these battles. I hope we didn't miss an important yeah, one. Yeah, I, I think what he might be talking about is he, I don't know, did he summon fire elementals and they got stuck behind his his front line and as a result overheated some of his magi? I didn't see that. Okay, so... Oh, that one was empty. Let's start with the northern front for end. Yeah, yeah. So he's... Kicked these guys off the top of his fort. It looks like there was a probably a commander that he assassinated that had bodyguards. That uh, this is what's left That's what behind. It like. Then and minor raid. Minor raid with some main. Okay, this is the Ivy King that it attacked a couple oh, turns right. ago. Right. The Anuki of Growth and Rebirth comes in here, just hits PD. Um, Dryad and Harpies. Okay, so just a bunch of raiding, and most of this raiding up here in the north is Pangea gaining ground. Um, and we have end having basically two armies that have fallen back. They were up here harassing this throne. Well, they've fallen back now. This one's back inside a fort. And this one um, looks like it's making its way back to this fort. Okay. But what so we see he... is this Pangean army, which I think was on top of this fort the previous turn, has jumped on top of these palisades. Um, and okay. yeah, this is, this is the throne he was talking about potentially getting, um, how many thrones does he have now? He has one, two, this would be three, this Quite would be four. Uh, to win this game, I forget if we need six or seven. Oh, you need eight. Ooh. Ooh. 16. Yeah. A half, right? Yeah. You put it at exactly half or half? Yeah, half. One. I think it's exactly half. Exactly half, right. 
Which, thank God we didn't put it at nine thrones to win. I mean, I'm just saying I'm getting six. He's, I mean, no one's, no one's anywhere close to winning by thrones yet. No, like, no. I think um, the most anybody has is... End. End has four. Yeah. And that's nowhere close, so... so no, no. But okay, so he may get this. I think, and so Sai was saying in his message that... Okay, he thinks that the... I think he's going to storm the fort south of Uruk so he can gateway. So let's go look at the Southern Theater. Yeah, I think that's what he was saying. Um, but this... Oh. He, oh, he did storm it. No, he stormed it. But this army was all consolidated on top of this palisade the turn before. And he just broke off a trivial, a trivial force. To take it. And he took the main force and put them on top of this fort. Which somehow huh. he has cracked. How did he crack it already? He must have cast Crumble. It's maybe. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Well, I thought you had to be on top before you could cast Crumble. No. Nope. Forgetting you that? can do it same turn. Uh, okay. Uh. I don't. I mean, I, unless he has siege power items here. Let's check real quick. Oh, Gate Cleaver. Ah. Uh, okay. Just one gate cleaver so far. Uh, Moonblade. Moonblade. That was a quick crack. And these guys aren't particularly. Was it just a Palisades? Um, this is Bone Reader, yeah. Um, no, it's a three hundred wall integrity fort. That's a little strange to me that he popped it this fast. Yeah, it is a little strange. Hmm. Okay. Uh, that, that's not quite adding up to me, but but good on him to pop it almost instantly. So this is interesting. He's gotten this fort off Pangea. Now, I was saying I did not like his moves to come out here and contest all this because he's going to have to give up all of this heartland. Um. But... He's potentially going to turn this into taking a cap in another fort. I still don't think I like... I don't think I would trade... Some of this may be just my intuition's wrong, but I don't feel like I like, even if he gets the cap, trading that for this choke point. Yeah. I feel like, well, too, maybe. part of it is the more chaotic things get with borders, like having pan stuff interspersed everywhere within stuff. Um, I feel like that benefits Pan more than it benefits End. Like, I feel like End wants to have more clear to find borders. And Pan is perfectly fine with, like, chaos, and I'll have a fort here and a fort there. But So I, I see something. Click on the mount chaining. Yeah, it's nothing's empty. here. I, I don't know where it went. Into that fort. I think that's yeah. the only place it could go. And a horde from hell, just north of that fort. Yeah. Um, okay. This is well, chaotic, man. This is super chaotic. I think there's some serious stuff inside that throne. Yeah. Uh, I think everything about chaining went into that throne because it only could move two places. Yeah. So there's something inside that throne. We can't see what it is, but I think there's something significant inside that throne. Yeah, I think you're right. So hell power, Sabbath, maybe there was some. Yeah, that could be all those darkness. things. There was, but he sort of accepted that he can't hold the Mount Chaining right now. Right. And and that might have been the right decision because even with a big PD dump, um, it's pretty hard to hold it unless he could afford it. Yeah, and he just doesn't. And you kind of don't want the intel getting out there that it's uh that it's here though. Well, maybe moving, that's another reason to move the army out of it is so that you're not giving it away. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I expect Pan will raid it. I don't know. See. Yeah, I'm not sure what the... Uh, I'm not sure what the... Um, what the strategic concept that Ian did this turn. I think we'll have to see it next turn. It'll be very interesting when we see it next turn and see how this... What Ian's grand plan is here. <clears throat> 
Okay, so to take a step back, Marilyn, this northern front, we have, there's basically a raiding battle, and there's three medium end armies, and there's three medium uh, pan armies. This is like a garbage pan army. Uh, I don't really count it, but there's yeah. three medium pan armies. Um, if we do a net of what's the infrastructure change, it's mostly in Pan's favor. Pan, Pan has taken Agartha and yeah. hasn't taken any infrastructure, and he's about to take this throne because um, yes. it doesn't seem like N's going to have much to gateway in here. And that's a lot of gems between yeah. Agartha and the throne and the other gems. Um, so this northern thing is swinging Pan's way. Yes. And... And there's a couple of fights that we had missed a while ago. Uh, one of them, he took, I don't know, like 50-something centaurs off the board. But aside from that, I don't think he's really taken much of the Pangean stuff off the board. Um, so I don't know. To me, it looks like the north is disintegrating. Um, but it's not done yet. Like, the, the die, in many ways, are still to be cast with... You know, Pan doesn't have any more this doom stack that he had before. I mean, he could combine these, but, you know, In could it combine his to, stuff too. It looks to me like Ind is making the decision to consolidate these little armies in the north. Because right. I believe that one, the one just slightly uh, northeast, that one there, I think it was just up above. Yeah. It's pulled back. The one in the middle between the two is really quite small. Yeah. So I think, and he might be moving it into this other fort that has a lab, the one to the southeast of it, where he can get it one turn, and then he might gateway it somewhere critical. So I think he's maybe made the decision, you know, he just can't, further poaching northwards was starting to fail. Yeah. He's got to pull back and try to kill one of these armies. Maybe. We don't know, but this is my estimate. Yeah, and he's we can see some Magog bitch mothers here too. He probably could have had... You know, one of the things we were, I was thinking about between kind of last episode and this one for end was, you know, mage composition. Does he have the right mage composition to fight the to fight the Pangean army? Well, these are both cave provinces, and the mages he was missing because he had a fair amount of maguses. I, I don't remember. I don't know how many he has left. Yeah, there's a few. The mages I think he was really missing were these uh, bitch mothers, and these are both provinces he was able to make them out of. So. <laughs> Good point. Losing so, yeah, like, losing these caves is cave. a big deal. Um, right. And the I, other I, thing about I, these I caves is he can not. cast darkness in them, and Pan's plan to deal with darkness was solar brilliance. And yes. you can't cast that in a cave. So, right, right, right. Those are good points. There were some... I, not, I, I did not think giving up Agartha was a good idea, um, yeah. the more I think about it. Like, strategically, he's just been losing ground on this front. However, you know, there's... He's there's still fight left in him, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, he's far from dead. On the southern front, at a high level, he's been making. We're on the northern front. He basically was losing ground. On the southern front, it looks like he's more making trades, and they're trading yeah. infrastructure. Uh, it looks like he might get Uruk, but if, to get it, he's going to have to give up probably both of these. So we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. But giving this up, I don't even know if I like that trade because it means he's turning off his Mount Chaining thing, which is kind of going to be his thing. How did an Ulmish army get up over there? Was that a Satis province? Oh, it was. Yeah, okay. it was. Yeah, right. That's the previous Satis yeah. in the border. Okay. Well. So this is interesting. I mean, this conflict is like chaotic and bloody, but for the most part, the armies aren't really fighting each other. They're fighting the infrastructure. <laughs> Yeah, I don't... Um, I haven't seen a fight quite like this ever before. So, yeah. I don't really know what to say. I I, I think I'm going to have to wait and and hold off till next turn because I am uh, I could see some possible things that End is planning, but it's hard to tell which ones he's really serious about. It looks to me like he's consolidating to hang on to the core around his capital. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty wise decision at this point in the game. Yeah. All right. 
All right. Well, I think that's about it for this episode. I think so too. And yeah, I don't, uh, I, we haven't missed anything, nothing from Uruk, just his little army sitting there. Yeah. He, he has yet to he, go on the, the adventure to double province size. Well, he might punch out at Zabalba now. Yeah. But if he does, he, he's very likely to meet up with Ashdod thugs. So if he's not discussing things with Ashdod, that could be a yeah. painful experience for one or the other. Yeah. Okay. All yeah, right. That's about it. Well, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, thank, thank you, you for joining me, Maryland. You're welcome. Okay. Bye, everybody. See you.